those of you that are watching by way of the internet, wherever you're watching from around the world, from around Canada, the United States, the Caribbean, Africa, Australia, Asia, wherever you're watching from. And I want to take a moment and pray as we move forward at this moment. Father, just want to thank you for this opportunity, for this privilege that has been given unto us even in moments like these, in crises and so many things that is happening around us in the last few months, weeks and days and hours. Things seem to be intensifying. The fears are intensifying. Everything, as your word tells us, Father, is literally being shaken. Every system is being shaken. Everything that can be shaken right now is being shaken. And in the midst of it, I am so grateful that you didn't only tell us as your people, the church, that you would shake the heavens, you would shake the earth, you would shake the nations and leave us at that. You told us what would not be shaken, that which would be impossible to be shaken. And you told us we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so, Father, I thank you that your kingdom is here. I thank you that your kingdom is alive and well on the earth. I thank you that your kingdom is eternal. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion is from generation to generation. Psalm 103 and verse 19 tells us that you have established your throne in the heaven. And your kingdom, your sovereignty... Your rule, your reign rules over all. And so I thank you for who you are as God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who is sovereign in your rule and in your authority, in your plans and your purposes, the one who sit king forever. And I am so grateful that you have chosen us, even before the foundations of the world, to be adapted to be sons through your son, Jesus Christ. And those whom you have foreknown, you predestined, and those whom you have predestined, you have called, whom you have called, you have justified, and whom you have justified, you've glorified. And so, Father, as I stand here to speak for your word, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word in season and out of season. As I stand here, Lord, to teach and preach your word, I thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the purpose of the anointing. And I give myself to the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak through my lips. He will move through me, think through me, and do whatever needs to be done to minister to those that are watching. Father, wherever they're watching from, you know the need. You know those who right now, Lord, they need to be comforted. Those who need their hope to be reaffirmed, to be strengthened. Those, Father, who need to be encouraged, those who need to experience peace. Father, you know what the need is, and I thank you that you know what we have need of even before we ask. And so in a given moment that that, that need is manifesting, we know what we should do just to thank you for the supply because you know that this would have happened before it happened. And so, Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit will minister to your people. I thank you for the word ministering to your people. I thank you, Lord, that lives will never be the same again. I thank you, Lord, for people being drawn into the kingdom, added to the church daily. Father, I ask in the name of the Lord that as the Holy Spirit and the anointing 
that is present in this room, in my body, in my life, upon me, that that tangible anointing will also be tangible wherever persons are watching right now. Father, thank you for hearing and thank you for answering. I give you all the honor and all the glory and the praise for what you are about to manifest in time, what was already done and is about to be put on display. We receive it. We tell you thanks, and we give you all the glory and all the honor through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Again, I want to welcome each and every one of you. Um, those who are a part of the immediate congregation here, you are tuning in, watching because of circumstances, as you know. Um, we can't gather the way that we normally would. And many of you have always looked forward to that, the fellowship. It's not about coming to the building, but it's what happened when we come to the building. And so at this moment, we're not able to do that. You're missed. And we're looking forward to the time when we'll be able to do that again. And we want to welcome those of you that are connecting with us even for the first time. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will have the freedom to minister to you as you open yourself up and to see the Word of God the way that it is meant for you to see it, for you to hear it the way that it's meant for you to hear it and to receive and experience it. So I want to go to the Word. I want to go to the Word. And I have been teaching on the kingdom of God for a number of years now. And I have come to understand that that's what the Lord wants us to teach and preach whomever he calls that is what we're supposed to be teaching and preaching so some of you might have never heard about the kingdom of God in the way that you're going to hear about it tonight this morning today whatever the time is for you wherever you're watching from I don't want you to ignore what you will hear and I'm going to show you the scripture I want you to receive it with an open mind as the church in Bira did in the book of Acts chapter 17 and search the scriptures and compare what you're hearing to see if this can be backed up by the scripture. Can it stand on the word? And if it is so, then it is your responsibility in Christ to receive what is so? What is truth? What Christ wants us to hear even at this time, in this season that the church has entered in. And it doesn't matter what's going on around us in the world. It doesn't stop or affect the season that God has brought the church into. So the church needs to understand, as I've been saying this now for a while, that we have entered into a particular season. We have entered into a certain season. There are seasons in God. There are times and seasons that are in God, just as we see the natural season that is around us. And in the natural, when the season is upon us, we have got to adjust. We have got to make some changes. We've got to make some adjustment, even in the way we dress. We've got to make adjustment in things that we are involved in, things that we do, so that we can benefit from the season that has now come upon us. Likewise in the spirit, because whatever is in the natural, as we see in Romans chapter 1 and, and, and Psalm chapter 19, and there are other passages that I can refer to, but those are two clear, plain passages that allows us to see that the natural things are meant to show off things about God for us to understand, especially those of us that are of God, understand these mysteries, these things that God has in place for us to come into and to allow him to be put and display in time around us. 
So the church has entered into a particular season and even the things that are going on around us, we don't need to be distracted because God told us through his word over and over and time and time again that days like these will come and what it is going to produce around us. And it's, it, it's, it's for us as God's people in these moments to stay anchored, steadfast, going, not reacting, but continue to act the way that we ought in the face of what is going on around us so that God can be seen by those who are in fear and, and the, the anxiety and all the things that is happening around. They are able to see a people, a nation, among the nations that have a stable government as a, and have a hope that is outside of this world and that hope is also available to them. But if they look on us and we're behaving like them, what hope are we giving them? If we're, behaving, if we're behaving different, if we're behaving above and beyond what is going on around us, we are behaving in a way that we understand that our God is in control. Our God is in control of our lives, is in control where his plans and purposes are concerned and being worked out. So all of that is and must be understood, must be seen, must be received in the context of the kingdom of God. So I'm talking about kingdom living now. And as I talk about kingdom living now, I want to remind you of what the scripture tells us. In Matthew chapter 3, it tells us that John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, came on the scene. And as he came on the scene, he had a message. He had a mission and he had a message. And the message and the mission was inseparable. They were, they, they were so tied together that if you take one from the other, it's going to compromise. If you, move, if you take the message away from the mission, the mission would be compromised. If you take the mission from the message, then it would also be compromised. So John came to represent the face of the coming one and there was a message that he came with and that was the message of the kingdom in John in in Matthew chapter 3 it tells us in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and after John preached the kingdom for a while Jesus now showed up Jesus was born uh, about six months after John the Baptist, or I, um, about three months or so, if you check it and see the time that the angel came and spoke to Elizabeth and then spoke to Mary. And it had to be John had to be born, John had to be, to be born before him because John was the forerunner. And the message, the very message that John came preaching about the kingdom of God, when we come over into Matthew chapter 4, we see that John was placed in prison in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4. And after Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, the Bible said he departed and he went into Galilee and he passed through certain regions. And as he passed through the regions, verse 17 tells us that Jesus began to teach and to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very message that John was preaching, Jesus, who is the king that John was talking about coming with the kingdom, when he came, he continued to teach and preach a kingdom. So we see that there is an importance to the kingdom of God because that's the message that Jesus taught and preached while he was here. And he taught and preached nothing else. Then he also commanded the apostles in Matthew chapter 10 to teach and preach the same thing. When we look at Acts chapter 1, when Jesus Christ died, buried, rose from the dead, the Bible said he appeared to the disciples 40 days. And for 40 days he spoke to them of nothing else but that which concerns the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 tells you that. I want you not just to listen but to check the scriptures for yourself and see that what I'm saying I'm not making it up. Because this is what the church need to be representing in times like these. Many, there, there's a few that have passed and there are this that is now happening. And, 
and 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 we have never seen anything like this before and there is many more to come because there are certain things that Jesus said would happen and they're going to happen in a sequence it's not going to be a one moment thing and then a long period of time. It's going to happen in a sequence. And when we see those things happen in the sequence that Jesus said it would happen, then that's a sign for the church to know that his coming is near. And the Bible tells us that one of the things that would be a clear sign of the Lord Jesus Christ returning is the message of the kingdom being preached in all the world as a witness to every nation and then shall the end come. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14 tells us that. The church was commanded to teach and preach nothing else but the kingdom of God. And there is a reason for that. And I'm going to touch on some things in this moment for you to see the importance of the message of the kingdom being taught by preachers who God call. And the church need to hear that message. And we need to understand the purpose that that message holds for the church. And without the church hearing that message and receiving that message and give themselves to that message and allow that message to become not just something that we hear, but it becomes a way of life, a way of life for us. We are going to be missing out on a lot of things that God wants us to come into. And the glory that the church is supposed to be giving him will be put on hold. And so I want you to hear me as I speak to you tonight about kingdom living now. And what I want to touch on in the context of that, in the context of that, for the past weeks I have been looking at the apostle, the, the, the starting of the year 2020, um, based on certain things that I was teaching on from 2018 coming over into 2019 and continue with that into 2019 all the way over into 2020 we connect this concept and idea realizing how important it is to the kingdom of God so we started looking at the apostles and how important the apostle is where the kingdom of God is concerned for the church and the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 that Jesus Christ, Jesus the King, the King himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And it tells us the reason for it, the purpose of why he gave these giftings so that the church would be nurtured, the church would be developed, equipped, tooled, to grow into that which God the Father wants the church to grow into. And when the church is now equipped in the way that it is meant to, through the apostles, through the apostles, the prophet, the evangelist, pastors, and teachers, the church would come to a place of showing off what God wants to be shown off through the church. Because the scripture tells us that in, in the same letter to the Ephesians, that God wants to show off his manifold wisdom through the church to the principalities and powers that there be. And the principalities and the powers that there be, it's a part of the arrangement of Satan's kingdom that is opposing the kingdom of God. And God is the greater king. God's kingdom is the greater kingdom. And God in no way is in no way in competition with the devil. God can never compete with the devil. The devil is trying to compete with God, but he cannot. And we as the church need to understand these things in order for God to continue to put on display things that was known to him from before the foundations of the world. So what I want to talk to you about for a little is this word, the battle between the two kingdoms. And you will see it on your screen. And I want you to take note of that. And I want to read the first passage that I want to read from, the first scripture that I want to read from, for you to see what I'm talking about here. 
and I'll, I'll, I'll break it down a little for you to understand what I'm talking about and for you to see what is going on. Even with viruses, disease, sickness, crime and violence and corruption and all of these things, I want us as the church to see the context in which all of these things are coming forward. What, what's, what's working behind the scenes and why is it that certain things are the way that it is? And the Bible tells us that we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. The Bible tells us that we should be sober, we should be watching, we should be vigilant, knowing that our adversary, the devil, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so if we understand what God is saying to us and we are functioning the way that God wants us to, it will not be easy for the devil to devour us. Because if we are vigilant, if we are sober, if we're watching, and it's, the question is, what is it that we're supposed to be watching for? We're supposed to be watching out for the devil, and then we should know how he works. We should also know why he is working the way that he's working. Because the scripture reveals all of these things to us, and we need to understand it. So the first passage that I want to read from is Colossians, the letter to the church in Coloss, which is also relevant for us today as believers, the things that we should understand about Christ, the Son of God, the one whom God has made king, God the Father has made king, and he has called us in Christ. And when we come to Christ, the Son, we have been given the position of sons and we must function in the way that Christ functioned to show off who God the Father was when he was here. The church must continue that. So as I talk about the battle between the two kingdoms, I want us to hear what Colossians chapter 1 is saying to us as believers when we are born again, what is it that we come into? What is it that we have entered into? What is it that we should understand that we have now come into? How does God view us? How should we view God? How should we view ourselves? How should we understand our purpose? How should we see our destiny from the moment we come to be in Christ? What is happening here once a person is born again. So Colossians chapter 1. And if you're able, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me if you're able to do so. If you're not able at the moment, take note of the scriptures. Go back, look at the scriptures and see that what I'm saying to you, I am not making it up. It is in the book. So Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of the Lord or of Jesus Christ, of Jesus the King. Jesus the King. Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua in English. It means Savior. Christ coming from the der derivative of the Hebrew word in Greek. The Hebrew word is Messiah. Christ, Christus in, e in, in Greek, which means the anointed one, the anointed king. So it's a Paul, an apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. For the, so, the, so the writing of this letter is coming from these two individuals. Both of them were apostles. Paul was the elder. Timothy was the younger. Paul was the mentor Timothy was the mentee. And so here, Paul state, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus. And I would say who are in Canada, who are in the United States, in the Caribbean, 
in Africa, in Australia, in Asia, Europe, wherever you're watching from, to the believers, to the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossus. Grace to you, grace to you, and peace. So even as you watch and listen, I am pronouncing grace and peace to you. What watch this? It's not coming from me. It's from God, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. From the Father and from the Son, whom he has made king. It says in verse 3, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith, since we heard of your faith, and watch this, this faith is placed in Christ. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your and and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before before in the word of the truth of the gospel the gospel concerning the kingdom of god verse 6 which has come to you the gospel which has come to you as it as also in all the world. So it is the will of God for the gospel of the kingdom to be preached in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. And when the gospel of the kingdom is preached and when that message is heard and received, there is a certain kind of fruit that it brings forth from the life of whomever receive it. It says that it's bringing forth fruit. As it is also among you, the brethren in Colossus. So everywhere, wherever this gospel is preached as it ought, and people receive it for what it is, there is a certain fruit that comes from God, comes through Christ, through the Holy Spirit in our lives, that is now showing off the truth that we have indeed received the gospel of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom, and we have entered the kingdom, and we're living in that kingdom, and that's what needs to be showed off even in times like these. But if you're not in the kingdom, it's impossible for that to happen. And so tonight I'm asking, today I'm asking, if you're not in the kingdom, you can come into the kingdom even at this time. It says, it says I want to read verse 6 again from the top. Which has come to you, the gospel of the kingdom, which has come to you, has it as also in the world, in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you. Since the day you heard it, since the day you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth, the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Verse 8, who also, Epaphras, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit, your love for one another in the Spirit. Verse 9, for this reason, so Paul says, for this reason, when Timothy and I and the other apostles heard, he said, for this reason also, since the day we heard it, heard of your faith, he heard of how you received the gospel of the kingdom, heard of how you have given yourself that the fruit of that gospel is coming forth and it is seen by those who are around you. He says, since we have heard of that, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy 
of the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord. Walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing him. Fully pleasing him. Fully pleasing him. The church has not been doing that for centuries now. And some of these things that are happening, God is allowing it to happen to even shake us up so that we will separate ourselves from the things that have been bombarding us and keeping us in, in mix up in all the different things that we have no right being mixed up in. But we ought to, we, we, we're supposed to walk worthy, live worthy of him and fully please only him. Being faithful, being fruitful. Verse 10, being fruitful in every good work and increasing, increasing in the knowledge of God. That's why even in moments like these where many of our church buildings are closed down, we are not able to gather as we normally would, there has to be some way and medium that the word continues to come forth, that you continue to increase in the knowledge of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if we're going to continue to increase in the knowledge of God, we have to be getting information. We've got to be receiving. We've got to be hearing and receiving knowledge concerning God. One other thing that the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15 when Israel was in a state of apostasy and backslide and turned to idols just like the church in many ways are today and I believe that as I said even in these moments it, 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 it's an opportunity where many are, are recommitting and, and checking themselves and, and, and asking certain questions that, that needs to come from the word and from the spirit and from God and when, 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 when God spoke to Jeremiah to speak to them and told them that if they turn from their backsliding way, God says, I will give you preachers, I will give you pastors, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. And they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3 and verse 15 says that. So here Paul said to the church, he said that you may walk, verse 10, I'm reading verse 10 again, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increase in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthen with all might. This is what, this is what we're praying for. That you be strengthened with all might, with all ability. And these abilities are coming from God, right? So the more we know of God and know about God and know in God, know from God, it allows us to experience certain abilities that only comes from God through his spirit to us as his people. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy with joy the joy that comes from the holy spirit the joy that comes from god verse 12 of colossians chapter 1 giving thanks giving thanks to the father to the father to the father and note the occurrence of the word father in the chapter the first time we see it mentioned in verse 2, then the second time in, in, in verse 3, and here it comes down here to verse 12, and it says, giving thanks to the Father, who, the Father, who has qualified us, the Father has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. In the light. Verse 13 allows us to understand what the context of that light is. What does that light look like? What is that light? Verse 13 says, He, the Father, has delivered us. So every single one of us that have come to faith in the Son, in Christ, he has delivered us, 
So this is salvation. This is the salvation that we experience when we come to faith in Christ. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, translated us into the kingdom. Note the kingdom of the son of his love. He has delivered us from the power of darkness or the power of Satan, according to Acts chapter 22, the power of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, it can also be said, can also be said for that. So he has delivered us from the power of darkness, from the power of Satan. And when he delivered us from the power of Satan, he didn't leave us in limbo. He didn't place us in a denomination. He conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. I am not making it up. That's what the word says. Verse 14. In whom the son, the son of his love, in whom, in the son, we have redemption. Through the son's blood, we experience forgiveness of sin. That's what verse 14 says. Verse 15 says, in the son, the son is the image of the invisible God, the father. The son is the firstborn over all creation because it is through him and by him that the father creates everything. So the son is the firstborn over all creation, verse 15. And verse 16 says, for by him, the son, all things were created. You see that? Through the Son, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Verse 17. Verse 17. I'm going to stop at verse 18. Verse 17 says, And he, the Son, is the beginning. He, the Son, is before all things. He, the Son, is before all things. So before God created anything, the Son was with him. He, the Son, is before all things. Verse 17. And in him, the Son, all things consist. In the Son, all things consist consist verse 18 and he he the son is the head of the body the church are you seeing that colossians 1 and verse 18 and he speaking of christ the son is the head of the body the church who is who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, speaking of the son, when he died and the father raised him from the dead, he is the firstborn from the dead in that way, that in all things, he the son, he the Lord Jesus Christ, may have the preeminence. May have the preeminence. I want you to listen carefully to some things that I'm going to say. And I am not going to be able to go to all of the passages and scriptures that I will be putting into the mix of what I will be talking about, if I may use that for lack of a better word. So what I want you to do is, if you're able to do so, is to take note of scriptures that I will mention as I unlock this mystery for the church to understand where we are right now, where is God in all of this, and how we're supposed to continue to function in all of this. I said that I want to share that the thought, the, the idea, the concept, that I want to share with you in this moment, and I don't know if I'll be able to complete it, conclude everything that needs to be said in 
uh, about this. So if I don't and I listen to the Holy Spirit, I'll continue to listen to the Holy Spirit and see if I will continue this into the next teaching where this is concerned. The battle between the two kingdoms. Now, the scripture that I re read here in Colossians, it highlights, and I, and, I can, and I can show you other places, but I'm going to start here because I read this. This is where the Holy Spirit wanted me to start from tonight with this. Or today, okay? Wherever, whatever time you're on. And as we notice in verse 12, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, because if he didn't qualify us, we could not be qualified outside of him. There is nothing that we could do, nothing that we can do, nothing that anybody can do. Only he alone could qualify us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. The saints in the light. So when we come to Christ, we're placed in light. Why is it so? Verse 13. Verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power. Take note. The power of darkness. So we see in verse 12 that once a person is born again and become a saint in the Lord Jesus Christ, because what saints mean here is that you are set apart. You are sanctified. So once we come to faith in Christ, that faith causes us to be set apart from certain things that we were once a part of, and now we're set apart unto God for the purposes of God. So what we see here in verse 13, it says clearly, we see the saints in light in verse 12, and then in verse 13 it said that we're delivered from the power of darkness. Hence, we're now in light because before God made us a worthy partaker, before we become saints in Christ, before we come to be in the light according to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says that you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people or a special people, God's special people. And hear what the scripture says. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So when I said a battle between the two kingdoms, there is a kingdom of light and there is a kingdom of darkness. So the kingdom of light is the kingdom of God. And we see it here in verse 13. He delivered us from the, king, from the power of darkness, from the rule, from the control of darkness, and conveyed us, translated us, transmigrated us into the kingdom, into the kingdom. So we're taken from one kingdom and we are placed in another kingdom. The kingdom that we're taken from, that's the kingdom that is opposing the kingdom of God. Hence, the battle between the two kingdoms. And we need to look at this a little closer and understand why certain things around us is happening. It says that we are now placed into the kingdom of the son of his love. The son of his love. The son of his love. I want to show you something. I want us to go to Psalm 2. And I'm going to read the entirety of that chapter. Psalm chapter 2. The book of Psalms. Psalm 2, chapter 2. And verses 1 through to 12. It has 12 verses. In Psalm chapter 2, we're going to see something here. And what we need to see is God giving us a prophetic sound, a prophetic window, if you may, be, being opened for us to look through and see Things that God had hidden in him, according to Colossians, according to Ephesians, 
things that were hidden in him, eternal purposes that were hidden in him before the foundations of the world. And, and what prophecy does, when we look at prophecies from even the Old Testament, when the prophets prophesy, they were allowing us to have an insight into things that God had concluded with himself and it's about to break forth in time. Whether when they spoke at the time it would be uh, uh, five years or ten years or fifteen or hundreds of years later when we think of even Christ and the prophecies concerning Christ. They were prophecy, they were prophecy that there are thousands of years, hundreds of years. In Isaiah, Isaiah prophesying 700 years before Christ even came. And so now we're having an insight into things that God had already concluded with himself, but it's now going to happen in time. And the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us in the book of um, Amos, Amos was a prophet. And what the Bible tells us in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, it said, it said surely the Lord will do nothing, watch this, unless he first reveal his secrets to his prophets. Not that he's not going to do anything, but before he does anything, anything manifesting in time, he reveals it to the prophets and the prophet would speak it forth. And once they speak it forth, it activates, it activates an economy from God in time to now support what God is about to manifest. So look here, Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2, you will also see the two kings and the two kingdoms that is in conflict. Here, Psalm 2, like you have never heard it before. Read it like you have never read it before. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and, watch this, the rulers take counsel together and all of this, the rage of the nations, the plotting of the people, the kings setting themselves up, the rulers taking counsel. What is that all about? Watch this. Against the Lord, against the Lord. And when it says the Lord here, it's talking about God the Father. And against his anointed, which is speaking of Christ the Son. And we'll listen. Hear what all of this is about. Saying, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast off or cast away their cards from us. What is this saying? They're saying that we don't want his rule. We don't want his rule. So what we see happening here, the kingdom of darkness is behind this. The influence, the work of Satan is behind the nations, the kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth, the people doing all of this to oppose the kingdom of God. To oppose God establishing his son as king in time. To bring about what we just read in Colossians chapter 1. Because the kingdom that we have been taken from the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of his son. This is where we see a clear prophecy of God putting that God having established that in eternity and the time is coming that it's going to break forth and there would be a serious rebellion against such. But would they get away in stopping God from accomplishing? Let us read on. So they said in verse 3, let us break their bonds in pieces and let us cast away their cards from us. We don't want their rule. We don't want to have anything to do with his kingdom. And so we are opposing him. Hence the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is not new to the New Testament. It was also existing in the Old Testament. Because that spirit came to be from the very moment that Adam sinned. 
Satan now had the opportunity, had an open door to establish certain things to come against God moving forward. The Bible tells us in verse 4, He who sits in the heavens. And according to Psalm 11 and verse 4, according to Psalm 103 and verse 19, According to Isaiah chapter 66, according to Acts chapter 7 and verse 49, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 34 and 35, and according to what we have read also in Colossians chapter 1, we know that God sitting in the heaven, heaven is his throne, and God is sitting as a king. So notice it says, God the Father, he who sits... Who, he who sits as king in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Verse 5 says, then, then he who is sitting in the heavens as king shall laugh. Laugh shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And verse, verse 7 says, verse 6 says rather, it says, yet I have set my king. So this is God the Father saying, in spite of the rebellion, the opposition that was coming from Satan, and nations became the face of it, people became the face of it, kings and rulers became the face of it, it could not stop me from accomplishing what I want, because I am God, I am the eternal God, I am the greater and so the Bible says in verse 6 of Psalm 2, Yet I have set my king, my son, Jesus Christ, I have set him on my holy hill of Zion, or the hill of my holiness. And verse 7 says, After the Father established him as king. And we see what Philippians chapter 2 says to us. In Philippians chapter 2, as Paul the apostle is writing to the church in Philippi. And the apostle Paul is one of those apostles that God grace him with an abundance of, of revelation, divine knowledge and understanding in regards to Christ the king and his kingdom. And as he, he writes to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 2, he tells us that Jesus, Jesus Christ, when he manifested in time, it was God, God manifesting himself in time, taking on flesh. The Bible said, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he took upon himself the form of a servant and humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And because he became obedient even to the death of the cross, it says God the Father highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And so the name that the, that the Father has given to him, it's clearly stated in Acts chapter 2. I read that chapter a few Tuesdays back as I was going and digging deep into the things concerning true apostles that needs to come forth today and the church need to be able to test them so that we do not continue to be experience the kind of deception that the church have experienced for so long and continue to be a part of. The time has come that the church must, the church must come forth and be what God intends for it to be. So the Bible said that God highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at that position, given him a position that is, that's what name speaks of, position that is above every position, that at the, that, 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 that at that, when you think of that position, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 says, when God raised him from the dead, he made him both Lord and Christ. So every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So now, what we see here in Psalm chapter 2, what we're reading is already fulfilled. And we need to understand why we have certain things even 
that we read in the New Testament. Now, in verse 7, it says, I, speaking of Jesus the Christ, speaking of the Son, after the Father established him as king on his holy hill, the holy hill of Zion, or the hill of his holiness, in verse 6, verse 7, the Son, who is now installed as king, said this, I will decree the decree, I will declare the decree of the Lord. So the Son is saying, I will, declare, I will declare the decree of the Lord, the Father. The Father has said to me, the Son. The Father has said to me, the Son, you are my Son. You see, I'm not making it up. He says, you are my Son. So what I want you to see here, that the one whom God has anointed King or installed King is also equally the Son of God. He is equally the Son of God. So he says, I will declare the decree of the Lord. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Today I have begotten you. I have fathered you. He came forth out of the womb of God. And verse 8, the father now said to the son who he has installed as king, the father said to the son, ask of me and I will give you the nations the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You, you the son, shall break them with a rod of iron. His rule is going to be strong. You shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings, be wise, O kings of the earth. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12, kiss the sun. Worship the sun. Recognize the sun. Recognize the sun. Because this is what God is about. Recognize the sun. He lest he, the father, be hungry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little, but a little. And then he says, blessed are all those who recognize the son and put their trust in him. What is going on here? The battle between the two kingdoms. What I'm about to say to you, it's in the book, it's written there. But it's going to be new, it's going to be strange to the hearing of a lot of you right now that are watching and listening. And as I said before, it doesn't mean that you should, you know, ignore it or quickly throw it aside. You have time because many of us are now... Some of us are laid off. Some of us are told to stay home and work from home. So you have a little more time. And some of you are not even doing any work from home. Everything is completely shut down. So you have some time to spend more time in this word. And I hope that you're doing so. Because when I look and saw what happened a few weeks ago, as this virus begin to spread across the world and see the kind of panic, the kind of anxiety, the fear that came upon so many people and to know that many who say they are so-called Christians and they know God and they love God and you know they go to church and they do all this stuff, they also got caught up in the fear and the uncertainty and all the things that are happening in the world. And let me tell you something, people of God, based on the word and based upon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not supposed to be shaken by what is going on around us or what will come. Because the scripture tells us that God has given us a kingdom. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 tells us, Seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness, his standard, his way of doing and being right, and all the things that you have need of will be added unto you. In Luke chapter 12, it tells us, verse 31 and 32, it tells us that we should seek the kingdom of God. And it says to us in verse 32, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us his kingdom. If you notice, the Father installed Christ, Jesus, the Son, as king. And if he installed him as king, it means that he gave him a kingdom. That's what we read in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. That we were delivered from the power, from the power of darkness. We were delivered from the power of Satan. And we were conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So if he made him king, if he installed him king, he also have a kingdom. And so those of us who come to faith in him, we are in that kingdom. We should understand that and we should know that that kingdom governs our way of life. Governs how we, what we think, how we think, what we say, what we do, our decision making, our way of life. It, it governs our purpose in life. It governs our destiny in life. The kingdom of God. Now, throughout what I have read so far, we, we, if, you, if you're following me and understanding what I'm saying to you, we're seeing two kingdoms. We're seeing two kingdoms. Not three, not four, not five. Two kingdoms. I think I said it on Sunday that where God is concerned, there's only two kingdoms and where the kingdoms of the world was concerned, um, there was a time when most of the nations, all of the nations, I should say, were a kingdom. And between uh, World War I and World War II, you had about 24 kingdoms that collapsed in Europe alone. Europe alone. 24 kingdom because France was a kingdom um, Italy was a kingdom all of these nations there today they were a kingdom and they all collapsed and what I'm saying in, in saying that is that all those kingdoms the kingdom of the world because if you look at Psalm 2 again and you look at verse 1 and 2 it's the kings and the rulers of the earth they were not representing God so if they were not representing God, who were they representing? Because if you notice, they were in opposition to what God wanted to now establish in time. And so they were the face of the kingdom of darkness. That reality continues to exist around us. The nations of the world around us, the world as we know it, governments, corporations, institutions, organizations, and stuff that are around us, they are under the influence of Satan, and they are in opposition to who God is and what God wants to continue to accomplish through his Son. And if you notice in Colossians chapter 1, as I read, there is a verse there that talks about Christ's body, which is the church. So the church is the face of the kingdom of God now. When John the Baptist came preaching it, in that moment, John the Baptist was the face of the kingdom. When John the Baptist was beheaded and killed, and Jesus Christ came on the scene and started preaching the kingdom, Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom, he continued to give face to that kingdom. And when he died and was buried and rose from the dead and ascended, he released the apostles to go forth and to allow the church to come forth that would continue to be the face of that kingdom. So the church would continue to experience the opposition that we saw in Psalm chapter 2. And that's what's happening even right now. I think about everything going on. And... In the United States, they have put certain things in place because of laws that are there in place for um, moments like these when, you know, if there is a, a pandemic, there is quarantine laws 
that are in place for the government to do certain things. And we see these things are happening. You know, the president is making certain um, um, rules and certain declarations and so on, and they, 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 they have to be followed. We see in Canada here and other parts of the world, the governments are doing what they're doing to minimize the, the spread of the, the virus. But if you listen, if you listen in, in, the, in, in, in all of what is being said and, and, and what is being done, and here in, 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 in Canada, um, they, they're, 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 they're stiffening the, the penalty, they're, they're strengthening certain things, and 11.59 tonight here, there are certain things that is going to be shut down completely, and it's only all, all, all the non-essential um, um, places and whatever is going to be closed on and only essential places, pharmacies, supermarkets and, and stuff like that and even the cannabis stores will remain open and the LCBO and the beer stores because those are essential, right? But in the midst of it all, nothing is said in regards to the church. They're actually, they're actually wanting the church to shut down too. Because they, how they view the church? The church is a non-essential entity in all of what is going on. But in the eyes of God, what is the church? Who is the church? What is the church about? So we see that the spirit... That was prophesied in Psalm 2 that would oppose God and his son and his kingdom continues to operate even in the present governments of the world. The church is of no relevance to the governments of the world today. None. And I have been talking about it for years. Go back and listen to previous teachings. And I have been saying that the church have lost its relevancy in the world around us. And there are many factors that are behind that. We see the church have adapted the cultures of the nations wherever it finds itself. Which should be a big no-no where God is concerned. But the church has forgotten who God is. We don't know God. We have walked away from the standard of God. We have made the church what we want it to be. We teach and preach what we feel like we should teach and preach. And as a result of that, we see the church have lost its saltness. The church have lost its relevancy. That when government put things in place, they don't, they don't even consult the church. They don't have a meeting and they don't have anybody that is the voice of the church in their consultation meetings that they're having. No. So therefore... The church in the midst of everything is considered a non-essential entity in, the, in all of what's happening. But thank God that YouTube exists and God knows that times like these would come about. And we have the opportunity. And I can come in an empty building, which is not the church, and speak to the church. Wherever you are, the church is in the kitchen right now. The church may be in the bedroom. The church may be in the living room, in the basement. The, wherever you are, you are the church. And I'm speaking to the church. And the scripture says, he who has an ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. What the spirit is saying to the church. So there's two kingdoms that is in conflict here. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. We cannot deny that Satan has a kingdom. And as much as we ought to recognize the kingdom of God, seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, 33. Luke 12, 31. Seek first the kingdom of God. As much as we are supposed to seek the kingdom, and if we're going to seek the kingdom of God, it means that we would have to come to this place of recognizing that God is a king and God has a kingdom. Likewise, and I could also say equally, in terms of understanding, we should recognize that there is a kingdom of Satan. There is a kingdom of darkness. And the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 12, 
In Luke chapter 11, Jesus was accused of healing a deaf, deaf, a deaf and dumb man by the power of Beelzebub, by spirits that are under Satan's influence or control. When they made the statement, the Bible said Jesus perceived what was in their minds, what were in their minds, and Jesus rebuked them in the moment and said, if I buy the Spirit of God, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, said the finger of God, if I by the Spirit of God, the authority of God, cast out demons, cast out spirits, then the kingdom of God has come among you. Then he said this. He said if king, listen, he said if Satan, if Satan is against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Because he said a nation divided against itself cannot stand. A family divided against itself cannot stand. A city divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan divide against himself, how can? Jesus said that. How can his kingdom stand? Now, now that we get to this juncture, I want us to think. Jesus said Satan has a kingdom. If Satan has a kingdom, every kingdom that there was, and kingdom that is, there is a, there, there are certain interests that exist in alignment with that kingdom. That, that kingdom exists for a particular reason. And you go back even into Israel and you look at kingdom and you see, you see the motive, you see the interest, you see the, 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 the projection, you see the conquest of the kingdom. And, and, and as, as you watch the conquest of that kingdom, you can tell what is it, that, what, is the, what is the mindset of that king, what is the objective of that king, what is it that that king is after, what is it that that king wants. To accomplish in regards to his rule, his influence. So think of it now, based on what I've said. What is the purpose of Satan's kingdom exist? Why is it that Satan has a kingdom? What is the purpose of his kingdom? What is the mandate of his kingdom? What is the conquest of Satan's kingdom? Jesus tells us in John chapter 10 and verse 10, for the thief, the thief, which is Satan, comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal what? Kill who? Destroy what? And so I want you to understand now that Satan does have a kingdom. So hence the battle between the two kingdoms. The next thing I want you to think on, and I know I won't be able to finish this. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm starting something that I'm going to pick up on and continue. Oh boy. The next thing I want you to understand and think about. If, if, and you go back again and you look at history, you go back even into the Bible, we see kingdoms in the scriptures goes out to conquer. They go out on a conquest. And when a kingdom goes out against another kingdom, the question is now, what is it that the other kingdom possess? Who is that king? What does that kingdom have? That this kingdom that is coming against that kingdom, that once they conquer them, they're now going to be in possession of that. With that said, I want you to think on this. Why did Satan, because Satan's kingdom did not exist from 
eternity past. Satan kingdom, Satan's kingdom starts in time. Because, why I'm saying this, listen now. Lucifer, according to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, was created by God as an archangel, a chief angel. And when pride entered into his heart, jealousy corrupt his mind. He, dis, he, he, he now organized, put a plan together to come against God. And this opened the door for the start of Satan's kingdom. When he decided to come against God, as we see in Isaiah chapter 14, he was cast out of his archangel position and falling from that position, remember what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10? He said, I saw when Satan fell like lightning from heaven. So when Lucifer was cast out of his position, he fell and he became Satan. And being cast out into the earth, he came down, the Bible said, with vengeance. And he established his kingdom. So his kingdom starts in time. God's kingdom has no beginning. God's kingdom has no end. God's kingdom, God's kingdom is eternal. God's kingdom is everlasting. Eternal in state. Everlasting in quality. The kingdom of Satan, if you understand what I'm saying right now, if it started in time, it means that it has an end. And the Bible also tells us, that there was a moment when Jesus showed up and there was a man that was demon possessed. And when the demon, when the demonic man, the man saw Jesus and he came and bowed down before Jesus, the demons that were in the man cried out to Jesus and said, why have you come to torment us before the time? Before the time. So Satan kingdom started in time. It's going to end with time. Hallelujah. It's going to end with time. But until it ends, there is a battle going on. And we need to understand why this battle is raging. Why this battle is raging. Let me show you something. And, I'll, and as I said, I'll, I'll pick up back on this and continue to build on it. I don't know how long I will go with it for, for, to, to, to bring out exactly what the Spirit wants us to hear. But let me touch on this. In, in Matthew chapter 4. Two kingdoms. And, and, and the other kingdom that is opposing, because God's kingdom is not the kingdom that is fighting against the other. It's the other kingdom. Satan's kingdom is fighting against God's kingdom. You look at Psalm 2 again and remember, the kings of the earth, the people, the people, the nations raging. The people plotting a vain thing. The kings took to counsel together. And the rulers of the earth stood up against the Lord and against his anointed. So God wasn't the one that was opposing they, the, 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 the system of the earth is opposing God. So the kingdom of Satan is opposing God. The question is, why did Satan establish a kingdom? Why? The word tells us, right? 
What is it that Satan wants to accomplish where the existence of his kingdom is concerned? Because every kingdom, as I said, as it, as it, as it exists, there, there's a certain, there are certain interests that that kingdom exists for. What is it that Satan is after? What is it that Satan is opposing God about? Because when you think of the word Satan, the word, the, 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 the name or the description that was given to the archangel when God originally created him, Lucifer means light bearer or son of the morning. When he fell from that position and became Satan, Satan means adversary, adversary. If you become the adversary of someone, you're opposing the person. The question is, what is, who is the person? What is the person about? What is it that you're opposing? If you're opposing the person, who is the person? If you're opposing what the person is about, what is it that the person is about that you're opposing them and you're opposing their interests? Satan, adversary, opposer. What is it that he is against? I'm going to read Matthew chapter 4 from verse 1 through to verse 11. Matthew chapter 4. It says, um, as a matter of fact, I need to connect it with something from chapter 3. So I'm going to start from chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, When he, Jesus, had been baptized, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, Jesus. Verse 17, and John heard the voice. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So God the Father is making this announcement. Continuing into chapter 4. Because there was no chapter, no verse. So as we continue into chapter 4, it said, Then Jesus was led up after baptism, after the Spirit came upon him, after the announcement from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Why is Satan an adversary of God? Why is Satan an adversary of the church? Why is Satan an adversary of every single person who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is there a kingdom of Satan, a kingdom of darkness? And all of what is going on around us, even the present, current situation, what does these two kingdoms have to do with all of it? Does it have anything to do with it? It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, watch this, by the devil. Jesus, who was baptized by John the Baptist, washed and set apart to be the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. The Holy Spirit came upon him, enduing him with power, and an announcement of affirmation came from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Let him, the same spirit that came upon him, let him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. By the devil. Watch the temptation. And I want you to watch what is at the center 
of the temptation. As we read, verse 2, when he, Jesus, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he, Jesus, was hungry. Verse 3, now when, when the tempter came to him, Jesus, he said, if you are the Son of God, <laughs> if you are, God announced, God announced earlier on, this is my beloved Son. Now the tempter, now the devil, now the opposer, according to Psalm 2, came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. What is at the center of the temptation? Whether or not Jesus, the man, believed that he was the Son of God in time. Christ was now occupying this body, this house called Jesus. Did the man, Jesus, believe that so that it would be able to put itself and display through him. Just like us, the church today, do we believe that we are sons of God in Christ so that what the Father wants to put on display, that in the face of the opposition, in the face of temptation, in the face of whatever comes against us, God is still able, because we believe it, to put himself on display through us. Jesus now was confronted. Notice he was led up into wilderness to be tempted, to be tested by the devil. And the test was on the basis of whether or not he believed and fully embraced that he was the son of God. The son of God. Because God is father. We see in Psalm 2, the father establishes son as king. This day have I begotten you. You are my son. You are my son. And then he says in verse 4, But he, Jesus, because he believed that he was indeed the Son of God, and he did not need, he did not need to do anything to prove that he was the Son of God. He knew and believed it. So when we are tempted as the church to do certain things, the devil is directly or indirectly saying, are you the son of God? Do you believe that you are? Do you believe that in your humanity you can be the son of God? Prove it. We don't need to do to prove that we are. We believe what God says and step into it. It says in verse 4, But he answered, he, Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God the Father. Watch this now. The devil is not finished. And I, I said, continue to pay attention what is at the center of the temptation. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up on up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Verse 6, what verse 6? And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Verse 8, again the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms that is under his kingdom so the kingdoms of the world, it's, it's government, governmental, government systems and, 
and, and corporations and institutions and organizations that are around us. If you look and see what is going on presently, as I've been teaching and preaching this for years, and in Agai chapter 2, in Hebrews chapter 12, and there's a few other scriptures. I read some of them last week, Tuesday, such as, as, such as 1 John chapter 2 and uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And what it says that the time would come where God would shake the heaven, shake the earth, shake the nations. Shaking the heavens, shaking the earth, shaking the nation. It's not about we're going to see physical buildings and earthquakes. Yes, there's going to be earthquake in the mix of it. But I want you to look beyond that. That right now, there is a, a shaking going on and systems, systems, the sports systems, the, the sports system is being shaken. Educational system is being shaken. Um, politics, government system is shaken. Every system, entertainment, name it, they're all being affected right now across the world. Think about it. For the first time in how many years, the Olympics is being postponed, canceled. Every system has been shaken. And they're under the control of Satan. So when Satan bring Jesus up, he showed him all the kingdoms, all the systems of the world, which is under his influence. He said, he said, verse 8, again the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, all the systems of the world and their glory, their wealth. The sports system, it's wealthy. But right now, they're, they're bleeding. They're losing a whole billions and billions and billions of dollars. The aviation system, they're losing billions. Every sector, every system right now is losing. Jesus was shown the systems and the wealth of the systems. And hear what Satan said to him. And he said in verse 9, he said to him, Jesus, the son, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus, those who have made sports their gods, we have made entertainment our gods. How are we doing now? <laughs> the God of sports can stop the virus. The God of sports can protect you from the virus. The God of entertainment. All the idols that we have established and reject the living God. The systems are now being shaken and the systems cannot help you. But there is a system. There is a God and there is a kingdom that is greater and is able to protect you. It's able to heal you and preserve you in the midst of everything. And it is the kingdom of God. Colossians 1 and 13. He can deliver you. And when he delivers you, he places you into the protection of his kingdom. Of his kingdom. So when Satan showed him all of these things, he said, if you will fall down and worship me. Many have been worshiping the systems of the world. He said, I will give you all of those things. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, away with you. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve, and him only you shall worship. Verse 11, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and minister to him. The church must believe that even in times like these, angels, it's not now that God is sending them. Angel, the angelic ministry has been always available to the church, for the church. 
And in these moments, we must believe that angels are there at work for us in various ways. People may laugh and mock and scorn at us, but who is going to have the last laugh, if I may say that, and use that for lack of a better word? Jesus, after he stood up against the adversary, against the deceiver, against the one that wanted to pull him away from the Father's plans, from the Father's purpose, from the Father's destiny, from glorifying the Father, he resisted him, and the Father sent angels to minister unto him. Angels are available for the church, to the church, in times like these. We need to believe our God. So there is a battle raging between the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, kingdom of deception, kingdom of truth, kingdom of disease, kingdom of health, healing, kingdom of death, kingdom of life. The king, the king of this kingdom is kingdom of light. The king of this kingdom, kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness is against God being father. And the reason why the kingdom of darkness is against God being father, as we see the temptation of Jesus, it was against him being the son of God. And the reason why the kingdom of darkness is against God being father, it's because of who God chose to be sons. And I am not going to be able to touch on that now. So I am going to leave it until we come back. I will dig deeper into that. So I want you to go back and I, I've said a lot of things. That you need to go back and watch it and go back and look at the scriptures and meditate it. And allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes and give you further understanding. And what we need to understand in these days. We should have understood it way before but because of the path that the church has taken the, ch the path that the church has taken so many of god's people are ignorant we we have we have very little understanding of the kingdom of god and why the kingdom exists and that the warfare the true warfare that the church is involved in it's there's two kingdoms there's a battle going on between two, between two kingdoms and the warfare that we're engaging, it's another kingdom that is opposing the kingdom of God that caused that warfare to exist. So even what's happening, it's because of God's plans and purposes, making himself father, choosing us to be sons. The kingdom of darkness is against such, and he has chosen humans to be his sons. And the devil come against a human for them to view God wrongly. So even in times like this, if you look back, every time certain disaster, certain distress, certain things happen on the earth, you will hear the human saying, where is God? And if God is love, why did he allow this to happen? And why, and why, and why, and where is God? And, and some of them come to a country and say, there is no God because if God was, then this would not have happened and all. So here it is that the kingdom that is opposing the kingdom of God is wheeling these things against the human for the human to have a wrong view of God and to reject God. Even in times when, we, when the human need to run to God, the enemy shows up to cause the human to be asking certain questions and viewing God in a certain way and rejecting God in the time when we need God. When we need God. The battle between the two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Satan. There's the kingdom of God. And I want you to think why Satan has a kingdom. You can even go a little further. Why does God have a kingdom? Seek first the kingdom of God. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us a kingdom. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why does God have a kingdom? And why did Satan start a kingdom in time? And the kingdom of God established and exists eternity past, eternity, eternity. There's no end to it. There's no beginning and there's no end. And why does Satan's kingdom exist? I want us to take this journey 
especially at this juncture in time, the church need to understand why we're here. No rapture is going to take place. Why are we here? And why did Jesus pray in John chapter 17? Father, I am not praying that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evils of the world. Or rather, the actual translation, keep them from the evil one. They're, the reason why evil... The reason why evil, disease and evil and corruption, there is an evil one. So you see, even in the midst of this now, the devil want people to blame God and say, why did God make this happen? We're, we're never thinking that there is an evil one. The battle between the two kingdoms. There is an evil kingdom and there is a good kingdom. There's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom of disease and there's a kingdom of health, a kingdom of healing. Where no sickness or disease exists. And there's a kingdom that is filled with virus and disease and, and all kinds of... There are sicknesses out there long before COVID-19. That there is no cure. And I don't think they will ever find any cure. And they have lists of disease that is known in the medical world as the incurable disease. That's in the kingdom of darkness. But in the kingdom of light, there is no incurable disease. God himself is health god himself is healing god is a healer and he has the power to heal all diseases and to preserve his people from all diseases the battle between the two kingdoms why why take the time you have time Oh yeah, you have time. We ain't going back to school for now on certain things. So you have time. Take the time and all the scriptures that I've read from and all the scriptures that I've quoted in the talk, go back, look at them. And as Paul said to Timothy, I pray that the Lord will give you further understanding as you think on these things. Meditate on these things. The kingdoms, the battle between the two kingdoms. I am in a empty building. The only persons in this room with me are those that are behind the cameras. There is no one else in this room. And the reason for that, it's because of the battle that is going on between the two kingdoms. You know what I want to say to you all, so I'm going to jump ahead of myself with this teaching. One of the kingdom has already won. That kingdom, the victory is set. The, if the, one of the kingdom has already won, it means that the other one is already defeated. And even though it's defeated, God permit, because 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us, it says, whoever continues to commit sin is of the devil. Because the devil, who is the king of the kingdom of darkness, sins from the beginning. See? From the beginning when he sinned against God, he fell from his state and became Satan. It says that the devil sinned from the beginning. And it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Satan is already defeated. And God is allowing certain things to play out to the end of time. Because you see, when time comes to the end, come to its end, Satan's kingdom will also come to an end. It is a beautiful time, and it's the church. Only the church is able to speak like this now. It is a glorious, beautiful time to be alive on planet Earth. And to see certain things that prophets and righteous men desire to see, but it wasn't for them. The church is now a part of God's plans and purpose being fulfilled and played out. And so, I want to leave you with that question. Why is there a battle going on between these two kingdoms? What is the interest of the kingdom that is opposing the other? What is it that it wants to conquer? What is it that it wants to take over? 
And so I bless you. As you watch from around the world, thank God that though we can gather, we still have this opportunity and this platform to come and minister the word to you wherever you are. And as I said, the people here that God has entrusted to me, people in Jamaica, the congregation there, you're not able to gather, but you're able to tune in and to be a part of this. And God bringing us and clustering us a, a global body of people. I bless you and I encourage you that in these moments, take the time that you have to draw closer to God. Because the scripture tells us as we see certain things begin to happen, look up because our redemption draw it nigh. I, I miss the physical gathering, but I understand. But in the spirit, we're still gathering. We're never separated in the spirit. Because the spirit has the ability to cluster all of us. And while we are apart bodily, yet we are together in the spirit. So I want to encourage you even at this moment to reach out to each other. Text, call, check up on each other. Check up on your neighbors. Do what is right and good in this moment. I have been doing my part. It's, it's kind of impossible for me to call every single person in, this, in the congregation. But those of you that have each other's number, do so. I have been reaching out to a few persons, checking up on them. Especially those who are alone by themselves and stuff like that. Making sure that, you know, are you okay? It's everything. So do that. Please take the time. And this is supposed to bring us closer together in the spirit, in the bond of brotherly love. Don't just say it, but do it. The Bible says that we should not love in, in words only. Don't tell me that you love me. And then in action, I can see it. I can find it. Take the time to reach out to each other. Call each other. Encourage each other. Pray with each other, share scriptures with each other on the phone, FaceTime. We have, we have Google Duo, you have FaceTime with iPhone and the other phones. I don't know what face they have, but FaceTime each other, see each other face, talk to each other, reach out to each other. Here in Canada, in Jamaica, across the world, and those of you that are joining in and watching and being a part of what God is saying to the church now. I bless you. And Father, I want to thank you for this moment. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this, the, the time that we're living in and to be alive at such a time as this. And, and what, what is even more glorious is to know that we have been called into the kingdom of God for such a time as this. As Mordecai said to Esther, who knows if God had not brought you to the kingdom for such a time as this. Father, I thank you for this platform, this medium that has now been established that we can seize it and, and take it, take the good part of it and do what is right and what is good and use it while there is so much evil that you can discover in YouTube, so much corruption and all kinds of, yet there, we, we, we can take it and, and do good with it and do right with it. Father, thank you for the word going forth. Thank you for the spirit ministering to your people. And those of you that are sick in body, whatever ailment are, that is coming against you, whatever is working against your, 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 your joints, your, your blood, tissue, your, your, your eyes, your ears, whatever, I release a word of healing right now. Jesus Christ is the healer. I release the spirit of, with the healing virtue to touch your body and for you to be healed. I rebuke sickness and disease. I rebuke the spirit of infirmity. I rebuke the spirit of oppression, the spirit of depression. I rebuke the spirit of bondage and I release the healing virtue of God to touch your body, touch your mind, touch your spirit, touch your life and bring healing to you. Father, thank you for your provision that is in place for us. I thank you for the manifestation of it in due time, in due season. I thank you, Lord, that in this moment, not one of your people will lack anything. The young lion do lack and suffer hunger, but those who fear the Lord shall not want any good thing. So, Father, thank you for your provision in every sense of the way of the word. I thank you, Lord, for providing for us physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, every area. I thank you, Lord, for your provision. And, Father, I thank you. 
that your word is sufficient, your grace is sufficient. So I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Be blessed, be safe, be preserved in the midst of everything because the Lord your God who is your Father, he promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Never leave you nor forsake you. I love you and I give you a hug in the spirit and I bless you. Continue to experience an unusual week in an unusual world and an unusual season and an unusual disease that is up on the earth right now. Continue to experience an unusual God in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. I will see you soon. We will continue our streaming as needs be. So if nothing change, then expect us to continue our streaming on Sunday. Um, this week would have been our mentorship um, school and class for those of you that are part of the mentorship school here. But based on what's happening, I am going to put that on hold um, because we have a number of persons that would come out in the morning, a number of persons that would come out in the night. So I'm going to put that on hold until a later date we will resume that. But for the time being, the other meetings, we will stream them as needs be. And I just pray over those that are a part of working behind the camera and doing what needs to be done in order for this streaming to come forth to you. I pray, Father, that you will continue to keep your hand upon them. May they continue to surrender to you. May they, Father, even go back and watch the teaching, listen to it, and allow themselves to be fed and to be built up and to come to the place of being exactly what you have called them into the kingdom at such a time as this. In the name of the Lord, I thank you for hearing and for granting that. Amen. Bless you. Bye-bye. And see you soon.